Our um, fifth individual presentation is in the area of genetics. Uh, Joshua Mayer is from the Academy for the Advancement of Science and Technology in New Jersey. His mentor, Robert Pergl Pergolosi, is the director of the Stem Cell Research Laboratories at the Academy. Joshua. Induced pluripotent stem cells, or iPSCs, can be generated from any somatic cell in the body, yet maintain the valuable attributes of pluripotency and self-renewal characteristic of embryonic stem cells. Unfortunately, though, iPSCs were recently found to be plagued with several problems, deeming them not applicable for clinical use. These include reprogramming associated genomic alterations, high levels of reactive oxygen species, and premature aging symptoms. Paradoxically, though, while iPSCs appear to rapidly age, on a genomic level, they actually get younger. This paradox has confused scientists for years, and to date, we still have no clear reason for their effects. Therefore, the first objective of my project was to understand why iPSCs rapidly age. I applied my understanding to cancer as a potential treatment, causing cancer cells to rapidly age and stop growing. Finally, I returned to stem cells, applying the converse of my cancer treatment to ameliorate the rapid aging symptoms of iPSCs, deriving stem cells that are more clinically useful. I began with the first objective, hypothesizing that since classical genomic approaches to aging have failed, that I could instead derive a new understanding through the mitochondrial genome. Mitochondria produce energy for the cells, but as they do so, they also leak out toxic byproducts that can react with mitochondrial DNA, causing mutations and deletions. Over time, these deletions accumulate, and when the mitochondria cease producing ample energy for the cells, the cells stop growing, or they age. In my project, I specifically hypothesized that iPSCs are victim to a 5,000 base pair deletion in their mitochondrial DNA, termed the common deletion due to its prevalence in aging. In order to test my hypothesis, I performed my experiments on several cell lines. I used human foreskin fibroblasts as a negative control since all the iPSCs used in my study were generated from these. I generated iPSCs using three distinct methods, microRNAs, retroviral vectors, and plasmid vectors. And I also tested cells from a patient with kern sire syndrome, since patients with this disease are known to harbor the common deletion. I tested for the deletion using a technique known as polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. PCR amplifies a specific portion of the genome denoted by primers, which are designed algorithmically. In the case of primers class A and class C, I flank the common deletion so that if the deletion is present, only the sides, or around 500 base pairs, are amplified. But if not, the entire region, or 5,500 base pairs, are amplified. The clear disparity between these two numbers makes the deletion quite easy to test for using gel electrophoresis, which separates the DNA based on size. I also designed primers class B to flank the entire mitochondrial genome and test whether other deletions were present as well. My results demonstrate that iPSCs generating each of the three methods did indeed exhibit the deletion. Panel A shows iPSCs generating retroviral vectors, showing that beforehand the human foreskin fibroblasts did not exhibit the deletion, but that after reprogramming the iPSCs did, suggesting that the deletion is indeed a result of the reprogramming process. Panel B shows similar data for the iPSCs generated using microRNA. Panel C, D, and E relate to the iPSCs with plasmid vectors. It's important to note at this point that I personally did not generate the iPSCs with microRNA or retroviral vectors, and that's because I was prohibited from directly handling the vectors in my high school lab. Therefore, those iPSC lines were obtained from certified vendors, but since I did have the opportunity to generate the iPSCs with plasmid vectors myself, I performed experimentation at various time points showing that one week, three weeks, and five weeks post-transfection, iPSCs exhibited the common deletion. I'd like to draw your attention specifically to panel D, which shows iPSCs with plasmid vectors, DNA amplified using class B primers. Recall that class B primers amplify the entire mitochondrial genome, yet we still see only one deletion, the common deletion, suggesting that that is the only deletion induced upon reprogramming, again consistent with the hypothesis. However, we do see another band, around 16,000 base pairs, showing undeleted mitochondrial DNA. When I found these results, I personally was a bit skeptical, thinking that if there were undeleted molecules present as well, perhaps there were not many deleted molecules that were present. Therefore, I designed a quantitative deletion detection assay to test the level at which cells harbor the common deletion. My assay is based on real-time polymerase chain reaction, which is again similar to normal PCR, but it adds an extra element to the mix, a fluorogenic probe and a quencher. By default, this fluorogenic probe is conjugated to the quencher so that the quencher quenches the fluorescence and the machine cannot detect it. However, as amplification takes place, DNA polymerase cleaves the fluorogenic probe from the quencher, allowing it to be checked by the machine. 
As amplification takes place, every time one amplicon is created, one fluorogenic probe is also released, and we can correlate the amount of fluorescence to the amount of amplification. But what's also really unique about RT-PCR is that we can use fluorogenic probes of different colors. Therefore, in my experiment, I am able to amplify different portions of the genome and compare between them. I amplify one region over here on where that amplifies only the common deletion. The DNA nucleotide sequence to which the fluorogenic probe and quencher are conjugated to spans both sides of the genome. So the deletion must be present in order for these two regions to attach and for amplification to take place normally. On the other side of the genome, I also amplify a constant control region where there are no known deletions. And by comparing the amount of amplification from the constant control region to the deleted experimental region, I can then determine a proportion of the deleted mitochondrial DNA. I began with the preliminary study showing that there was no statistical significance between results obtained from total DNA and mitochondrial DNA, suggesting that for future experiments, I wouldn't have to take the time or the effort to extract mitochondria, but I can jump directly to the total DNA. In terms of the results themselves, I found that there was a 4,000-fold increase in the deleted to total DNA ratio in the iPSCs at just one week of reprogramming. At first, these numbers might seem to be quite high, and one might be skeptical, but we must consider them in the context of the cell. Every cell can contain up to 10,000 mitochondria, with every mitochondrion containing between 1 and 15 copies of its genome. Therefore, every cell can contain up to 150,000 copies of mitochondrial DNA, and the 4,000-fold increase we observe is reasonable in this context. After finding such a significant elevation in this deletion ratio, I then performed a transmission electron microscopy study to determine whether the underlying genomic features cause iPSCs to transform morphologically. On this slide, we see mitochondria from human foreskin fibroblasts and embryonic stem cells. The mitochondria appear circular. They have well-defined cristae around half a micrometer diameter, so they look quite healthy. But when we then look at the mitochondria from the iPSCs, the mitochondria no longer look standard whatsoever. They've become elongated and huge. That same trend is seen in the, in the mitochondria from the lung cancer and prostate cancer, and in two types of breast cancer. And I quantified all of my data using imagery from the National Institutes of Health to demonstrate that I wasn't just putting up the nicest pictures, but this is indeed something that we see across the board. In the iPSCs and in each of the four cancer cell lines, we see a significant elevation in the major axis to minor axis ratio, suggesting that the mitochondria are becoming stretched. This stretched morphology, according to previous literature, is known to be associated with premature senescence, or aging. In terms of the iPSCs, this makes sense. The iPSCs that I was looking at have features of rapid aging, and therefore the mitochondria look like they're rapidly aged. In terms of the cancer cells, we can also explain this. The cancer cells I tested were derived from old patients, seeing as the patients were old, the mitochondria also look aged. However, despite that fact, the cancer cells I tested not, did not exhibit a significant level of that age-related common deletion. This was odd because, again, the common deletion is age-related, and these cancer cells were aged. This, therefore, suggested that cancer cells contain a mitochondrial DNA conservation mechanism to protect against deleted mitochondrial DNA. Now, there were two applications to this finding. One is that if we could remove this conservation mechanism from cancer cells, perhaps we can get the deletion be sustained in the cancer cells. We would be able to get the cancer cells to start aging normally, and they would stop growing. The second application to the finding is that if we could understand which genes control this process, then we would be able to, in turn, activate those genes in iPSCs. We would be able to purge iPSCs of their common deletions, deriving stem cells without features of rapid aging that are more clinically useful. So in order to tackle both of these applications, I would have to understand how the conservation mechanism worked and on what it was acting, how the deletions were arising to begin with. So I hypothesized on the lowest level that it was due to something with the reprogramming process and not just due to the normal properties of self renewal and pluripotency in, in iPSCs. I did a study with embryonic stem cells. I found embryonic stem cells, despite those properties, did not exhibit the deletion. So that suggests that there is something else that we are doing to the iPSCs when we make them that is inducing these deletions. So coming back to my first slide when I began in the beginning, one of the primary reasons why we can't use iPSCs in the clinic is because they have high levels of reactive oxygen species. So I hypothesized that these reactive oxygen species might be the reasons why we get these deletions on a low level. So I treated A549 lung cancer cells with paraquat or PQ, which is a herbicide catalyst of these reactive oxygen species. I found that at 24, 48, and 72 hours of treatment, I had a significant induction of the deletion. Unfortunately, though, paraquat is not a clinically applicable treatment. If you were to treat a patient with paraquat, you'd probably kill the, the cancer, but you'd kill the patient as well because paraquat is poisonous. So I wanted to find on a higher level some gene that would modulate these reactive oxygen species, something we can control safely. So my studies hold on this specific gene called sirt 2 one or SIRT1, which controls antioxidants in the cells through the FOXO pathways. Antioxidants mitigate the effects of reactive oxygen species. 
CERT1 is also importantly involved in crosstalk between the nuclear genome and the mitochondrial genome. Cancer is a disease of the nuclear genome, and iPSCs are created by forced expression of nuclear genes. Therefore, effects on the mitochondrial genome might have to pass through CERT1 in these cells, and I hypothesized that by knocking out CERT1, I would be able to induce the deletion. Indeed, both genomic inhibition of both genomic silencing of CERT1 using shRNA and pharmacological inhibition of CERT1 with EX527 both resulted in a significant induction of the deletion, as confirmed by both PCR and quantitative analysis. After finding that this was able to induce the deletion, I wanted to see whether it caused the cancer cells to age, and I therefore performed an assay for senescence-associated beta-galactositis, which is a biomarker of aging. In this experiment, all cells that have become aged or senescent appear blue. So I began with another preliminary experiment, this time with ethidium bromide, which previous literature has shown that if you treat cells with ethidium bromide for a couple of weeks, the mitochondrial DNA actually gets depleted. So in the cancer cells, we find that almost all of the cancer cells stop growing. Almost all of them appear blue. But when I performed a parallel experiment with the human foreskin fireblast, there's a mixed population of cells. I actually saw images from two parts of the plate because these senescent cells secrete factors that cause their neighbors to perform, become senescent. So I showed uh, pictures from different parts of the plate. What's interesting, though, is that the cancer cells were more reliant on their mitochondrial DNA for proliferation, suggesting that mitochondrial genome control could work as a selective treatment. When it came time for the experiment itself with the CERT1 knockdown, I found that almost all the A54N lung cancer cells again stopped growing when we induced the deletion, but in terms of the normal cells, there is an almost undetectable level of senescence. This suggests that inducing the deletion causes the cancer cells to stop growing without causing a significant effect in the normal cells. Of course, this is only one biomarker of aging, and for future experiments, I want to look at other biomarkers and look at other side effects to further confirm these experiments. But these are promising results showing that this deletion might indeed be something that controls proliferation, and that by inducing this deletion, we might be able to derive a clinically applicable selective treatment. Anyway, I moved on to my third objective, which was to apply the converse of this treatment to ameliorate the rapid aging effects of iPSCs. I hypothesized that since induction of the deletion, that since inhibition of CERT1 induced the deletion, activation of CERT1 would ameliorate it. In fact, I found that treatment with NMN, nicotinamide mononucleotide, which is a CERT1 activator, caused the depletion in mitochondrial DNA copy number, suggesting that these deletions were indeed going away. I also found a reduction in reactive oxygen species and an increase in mitochondrial mass, all this within one week, showing that one week of NMN treatment was enough to make the iPSCs overall better on a mitochondrial level. In summary, my study demonstrates the discovery that iPSCs contain a 5,000 base pair deletion in their mitochondrial DNA. I applied my finding to cancer cells as a potential treatment, causing the cancer cells to stop growing. Finally, I returned to stem cells applying the converse of that treatment to ameliorate the rapid aging effects. But this is more than just a potential cancer treatment or a new way to make stem cells. This is a platform technology. What I've shown here is a new way to control the mitochondrial genome. And there are so many other age-related and mitochondrially rooted diseases out there. And I can't wait to see how we can take the groundwork that I've laid here, take this mitochondrial genome control, and apply it to diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's that use them as well. Thank you. And these are my acknowledgments.